David. Now this program is going to be about asteroids and not everyone will know what they are. But well, asteroids are comparatively small worlds going around the sun in the same way that we do, many, although not all, between the paths of Mars and Jupiter. And telescopically, they look like stars, but they're certainly not. They are quite different. Only one series is as much as 500 miles across, and only one, Vesta, is ever visible with the naked eye. Well, to talk about those, Chris Sensor, back from America, and one of my old friends, Alan Fitzsimmons. Alan, the Dawn probe has been sent up and is now orbiting at Vesta. Can you take us with the Dawn probe to what it is? Well, it's a fantastic mission. It's a mission to visit both Vesta and Ceres, as, as you've mentioned already. It's in orbit now about Vesta successfully, and for the next year it's going to be studying in great detail this amazing world, which we believe has been there in, in roughly in the same place since the dawn of the solar system, and it's going to give us clues as to how the asteroids evolved over that time. And we've got some amazing pictures of the kind you've never seen before. Let's have a look on a few of them. Well, I mean, these are fantastic images. We, we've had some very low-resolution shots taken by telescopes on Earth and, of course, by the Hubble Space Telescope. But these show the detail that really the Dawn mission was designed to provide. Mountains, us with. valleys and craters. Absolutely. And many of the views, of course, at the moment, just of the southern hemisphere of Vesta, because as Dawn approached the asteroid, it came up really from below to get yes. into orbit. And that was particularly important for us because what we're seeing in these first ever close-up images of Vesta is the sign of a tremendous impact that happened possibly three and a half billion years ago that literally shook this small world to its very foundations. I have to say, I have trouble picking out an impact crater on, on this image. Which of, which of these craters is the impact crater that you're talking about? The reason that we, in fact, I think we all have problems here because here we're looking at a crater that's about the size of the body we're Ooh. looking at. The whole image is almost... Absolutely. So we, when we look at this, we see this huge huge mountain facing us that, that's probably about 15 to 20 miles high and, and about 50 or even 100 miles across. So that's, what, three times Everest if you scale up to Earth size? Absolutely. So relative oh, yes. to the size of the Earth. Absolutely, wow. about the size of the largest volcano on Mars, Olympus okay. Mons. And that is, in fact, the central peak of the crater. So this is material that was thrown up and came back down. Absolutely. And then surrounding it, out to about the radius of the asteroid itself, is the, the depression or the bowl so of the crater. So on the right there, you can almost see those might be the walls that were, were once the walls of the crater, I guess. A absolutely. And scattered bits in all directions. That's right. What we now know from telescopic studies in the 1990s and since then is that around Vesta in the asteroid belt are fragments of Vesta. Some of these fragments of Vesta have actually arrived on the Earth. And I'm glad to say we have one with us now. Absolutely, Patrick, and, and here it is. And there's two things you can see when you look at this. First, we can see that it's composed of very angular, small, dark fragments. These are the fragments of original basalt that have been compressed into a rock by other rocks falling on top of them due to other impacts. Second thing, though, you notice is that uh, you don't see any glittering due to metals. No. And, and quite often, as you know, when you find meteorites, they're highly magnetic yes, because, yeah. of the, because they contain lots of iron and, and this nickel. This not. Absolutely not. And that's because Vesta has formed its iron core when it was molten. All the metals, of course, sank down into the centre of the body by and large. So this is relatively metal poor. So these two clues tell us that this came from a volcanic body. So it's amazing to think that here in the studio, we're actually seeing and touching a piece of another world so far away. Absolutely, and of course some might say that if you know so much about it, if you've, if you've already got a piece here, why do you need to send a spacecraft to Vesta? Ah, that's another story. That's, that's right. Well, in fact, of course, it's because we have this that we know it's worthwhile sending Dawn there in the first place. Well, the Vesta was fascinating, and before long we're going to hear a great deal more about it. Chris, Alan... 
Thank you very much. Well, quite apart from the big asteroids, there are many, many smaller ones, some of which come surprisingly close to the Earth. And one did so quite recently. And Paul Abel has been talking about these near-Earth objects. We all lead busy, hectic lives, and the thought of an asteroid coming at us from the depths of space isn't something we worry about a great deal. We go to bed at night and presume our civilization will be there in the morning. But there are some big asteroids out there with the potential to do a lot of damage, and some of them pass dangerously close to the Earth. In the sleepy Berkshire village of Great Shefford lives an astronomical sentinel. By day, Peter Birtwistle works in IT. But by night, he is a defender of the Earth, scanning the skies for asteroids. Peter took this footage of asteroid 2011 MD back in June. It was the size of a double-decker bus and passed just 7,500 miles from the Earth. It looked so close, you could touch it. Hello, Peter. Hello. Oh, this is the most impressive setup you have here. <laughs> so, uh, why don't you tell us then, how did you get involved with uh, 2011 MD? Well, I was, I was out observing that night following near Earth objects that I'd normally do anyway, and uh, it was the en discovery was announced about three quarters of an hour before dawn, uh, which gave me just enough time to try and find it. That's you must have been elated when you found it. It was, it was one of a couple of objects put on, on at that time, and I chose that one to try and uh, go for it just had enough time to do so, uh, and it showed that it was going to make a really close pass to the Earth um, in about five days from then. Did you feel, oh my word, this well, is the it, end? It, <laughs> not quite, but it was, it was, very, it was exceptionally close. There are around 8,000 near-Earth asteroids out there, too many for professional astronomers to track. Amateurs like Peter play a valuable role pinning down these astronomical vermin that could prove vital if one were heading for us. In actual fact, what size objects really pose a danger to the Earth? Well, a um, big problem would be a kilometre diameter size right. object. That, that would cause you know, quite a catastrophe on Earth. Right. There are a number of those that have been discovered near Earth objects, that, but all of those have been observed enough to know that they're not going to hit us in the foreseeable future. But there is a great but, potential for material out there. Well, there, there are a lot of smaller ones, and the you know, smaller ones 100, 200 metres across can still cause regional problems. Right. You know. Our last regional problem happened in 1908, when an asteroid hit Siberia. It flattened a hundred million trees over an area of 2,000 square kilometres. That's the equivalent of everything inside the M25. And I have to ask, if you should discover a tremendously large asteroid heading our way, <laughs> What would you do? I, I'd go down to the pub. OK. That no. would be my... I'd, I'd try and get another few positions on it. <laughs> <laughs> Dedicated to the last. Peter, thank you very much. OK. Some time ago, somebody came to me and said, um, what would you advise me to do if we saw a mile-wide asteroid heading straight for the Earth on a certain collision course? I said, I'd recommend this. Um, repeat very slowly. After me, our father, and that's as far as I got. At least there's plenty to see in the sky, and Pete and Paul are outside waiting for us. Well, Pete, only a few hours of darkness this time of year, but uh, nevertheless, plenty of things to look at. There are. In August, you really have to cram your observations you do in, don't you? have to cram them in, yeah. <laughs> so uh, what do you think we should look at first? Well, we've just been talking about the Dawn mission to go and see Vesta and Ceres, so why don't we try and locate where Vesta and Ceres are in the night sky? Amateurs can see them with just a pair of binoculars or even a telescope. Indeed. Well, here we are, Pete, with Patrick's 12 and a half inch reflector. Uh, one of my favourite telescopes here, actually. It's the one I normally use. But you don't need a telescope as vast as this one to see Vesta, do you? You don't at all. I mean, Vesta is actually the brightest of the asteroids. Mm. And uh, you can see it in a pair of binoculars fairly easily. And at the moment, Vesta is actually coming to opposition. It comes to opposition on the 5th of August. So it's opposite the sun in the sky. That's exactly right. And that's the time when it's at its brightest. Right. And this is a particularly good opposition of Vesta because it will be be 
just bright enough to be able to be seen with the naked eye. If you're in a dark sky, I Well, it's, it's slightly brighter than the planet Uranus. Not by very much, but it is slightly <laughs> brighter than that. So that The telescope will show its disc, won't it? It's, if you've got a big telescope, it has got a tiny disc, but really binoculars are the way to secure the deal and just, just get a glimpse of it. And at the moment, it's in the constellation of Capricornus, the right. sea goat. The sea goat, but that's not what you've called it. It's, it's a bit like a misshapen <laughs> triangle, but to me, it always looks a bit like a misshapen <laughs> sandwich. Right. And it ends the month very close to the star Psi Capricorni. Oh, very nice. So uh, some easy pointers to find it, though. Vesta, of course, not the only uh, asteroid we have in the night sky. We also have Ceres, named after the goddess of cereals. Is that so? <laughs> it is, yes. But it's in a rather obscure part of the it's sky. It's in Cetus, isn't it? The it whale. is. It's quite close to the tail of the whale. That's The tail of the whale is marked by the star Difta. Yes. And this is where we can find this asteroid. <laughs> yeah, it's moving in a quite a small arc around that region. So, um, again, you will need to use optical assistance to find it. Well, we don't just have dwarf planets and mm -hmm. asteroids, we also have the other planets and the enormous planet Jupiter. This is making an enormous comeback. To be honest, Paul, over the next few months, there's going to be one word, I think, which is going to sum up Jupiter, and that will be wow. Yeah, it's quite it is great. going to be an incredible sight for it's, us. It has, and we have some interesting satellite phenomena. If you go out in the mornings of the 7th, 14th and 21st of August, you'll see Ganymede passing in front of the Jovian disk, which we call a transit, and Ganymede and its shadow passing in front of the disk is quite a spectacle. It is. That shadow when it's on the disk is incredible because it's so round and it dark. Is. It and is it's... very black. Yeah. And it's so hard to miss it. And even, I've seen it in a four-inch telescope watching it go through. Beautiful thing. And I'm very, very excited to have Jupiter back because it's been in the murk for all these years and now it's coming back. Well, good for us. It's climbing higher in the sky. It'll be about 50 degrees up at its best and that's incredible. The view we're going to get of it is going to be amazing. <laughs> well, Pete, all these wonderful things to squeeze into the few small hours of darkness in August so I think it'd be quite interesting to go out and look at some of those things. Mm. Pete and Paul, thank you very much. Back in my study with Chris North and Chris Lindholm. I'll begin if I may. A new satellite of Pluto has just been discovered. We know three, the big one Charon and two small ones Nix and Hydra. Now this new satellite is again small, 20 kilometers across but there it is, and of course, a name has got to be found for it. Presumably something to do with the underworld. Well, my suggestion is Thanatos, after the god of death. But I wonder what the others think. So we invite the others to send in their ideas about naming the new moon of Pluto. So there we have the outer solar system. But uh, what about the inner planets? Mars back in the news? Yes, we have Curiosity, which is the next probe to Mars, sort of the size of a big car. And that's been shipped from JPL in California, where it's assembled, over to Florida, ready for launch later this year. So what about the landing site on Mars? The choice is a wonderful crater called uh, Gaul or Galle. I'm not sure which it is. Gale. Like, Gale Crater. Well, I was close. So Gale, Gale Crater. Gale. And the thing about Gale Crater is it's much deeper than anywhere we've visited on Mars before. And that means you can get much further back into the history of the Martian past. What else do you have for us? Well, this is something very close to home, which is right behind me here. This is a new award from the Royal Astronomical Society. This is the Patrick Moore Medal which is not for you, it's for the teacher or educator who's done something remarkable to inspire interest in astronomy. And so the Royal Astronomical Society have asked us to, to tell people to send in their nominations for this award. Why well, name it after me? Many of you have done so much more than I have. Well, you inspired both Chris and I, right, Chris? <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's, it's very easy to nominate people. Uh, you can go onto the RAS's website. So you go to www.ras.org.uk slash Patrick Moore Medal, and you can nominate the person or the teacher who's inspired you most uh, in astronomy or geophysics. Well, there's one last news note, and that's some worrying news from the United States, which is that the Congress, their government, are considering cancelling the James Webb Space Telescope. Oh, I heard about that. I can hardly believe it. Yes, it would be a disaster for the, the future of astronomy in many respects. Well, a short while ago, I went to the Rutherford Appleton Labs to take a look at one of the instruments that's being built in the UK to go on the James Webb Space Telescope. The Rutherford Appleton Lab in Oxfordshire is where they design and build telescope instruments. The latest is the mid-infrared instrument, or MIRI, and it will soon be fitted onto the world's most ambitious satellite, the James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST. Before it can begin its long journey, it has to be tested to withstand the conditions it will encounter in outer space. To get close to MIRI, 
I have to put on this attractive bunny suit. I don't think I've ever been so clean. This is the test chamber, and inside, Miri is being subjected to the harsh conditions of space. What we have here is its twin sister. Light comes in from the massive telescope to this part down the bottom. It's fed up to the camera where the images are taken, and a small amount is sent up to the spectrometer, where the light is spread out into its range of wavelengths so we can pick out specific types of element and molecule and work out what the chemistry is like in outer space. The JWST has a mirror six and a half metres in diameter and will look at longer wavelengths than Hubble. This allows it to see cooler objects, providing astronomers with views of the formation of galaxies, stars and even planets. There, Professor Gillian Wright has been involved with designing MIRI and the JWST since the 1990s. It's taken a life's work to help construct the replacement for Hubble. It differs from Hubble in that it's a much bigger telescope and we know from, for example, the discoveries that have been made in the Hubble deep field that galaxy evolution happened much earlier in the evolution of the universe than, than we knew before Hubble. And so what we would like to do is to study those more distant galaxies and to do that we need a much bigger telescope. Taking images in the infrared is technically challenging. With a million pixels, Miri's mid-infrared camera is the largest ever built. Infrared astronomy has come a long way in just a few decades. In fact, when I started as a mid-infrared astronomer, we had one pixel, <laughs> and that was the best detector you could get. <laughs> detector technology has changed a lot. We know how to do big telescopes in space now with Herschel and then J JWST, and so people talk about this now as becoming the era of the infrared because a lot of the cutting-edge discoveries we expect to come from this working at these longer wavelengths. In the next few weeks, Miri will have completed its tests and be shipped to NASA to be fitted onto the spacecraft. However, with budget problems in the US, there is a real threat that the JWST could be scrapped. If this happens, the loss to us all would be profound. The chance to understand our universe closed for decades. So let's only hope that common sense prevails. Meanwhile, we've had some lovely pictures sent in and some here of not delusent clouds and these really are really beautiful. They're incredible. One of the best things about observing in the summertime, I think. If people want to send in their own images for us to look at or to use on the programme, they can do so through the Flickr section of our website at bbc.co.uk slash skyatnight. And we have some wonderful images there. But the image I'll be staring at this month is this one from the Herschel Space Telescope. Looking at it's an infrared image of our own galactic centre. And if you look carefully, you can see this twisted loop of material around the centre itself. And it's really quite difficult to explain why that material's there or why it's in this twisted form. So I shall be staring at that and wondering for most of the next month. I'm quite sure you will. And the image I've picked out is one from orbit around Earth. So this is an image by an astronaut on the International Space Station. And what's stunning about this is quite how much is in there. You've got the solar panels of the space station. You've got one of the, the a part of the space shuttle Atlantis. You then got the Earth and the aurora in the in the atmosphere. And then you've got some of the star clusters and, and stars towards the centre of our galaxy. And of course, this is one of the last times we'll get an image with the uh, space shuttle uh, in orbit. Well, thank you both very much. I want to come back next month. We'll be talking about the future of space exploration. We'll be joined by astronaut Pierce Sellers. So until then, good night.